So it's gonna be more theoretical, less less glamorous, I guess, than than you know other work that we might have been doing that looked at real data. But it, it was basically this project's looking at how the observed severity of cases fluctuates across an epidemic. Um, and so this has become quite an obvious issue, I guess, during COVID, because we've you know we've been monitoring it so closely and we've had so, so many sort of waves in in quick succession. And you can just see if you look at, say, case severity risks or case fatality, case hospitalization rates, you can see that these things are fluctuating over time. And so we basically we were wondering why. Um, and so this is some work that I've done um, in collaboration with the MRC Biostatistics Unit, just trying to understand this problem um, and work out why it was happening. And it's, it's a relatively simple problem, but it's not really seen much attention in the literature. And I imagine this is due to the nature of, of COVID relative to other pandemics. Um, because we've seen these waves so close together, um, it becomes really prominent, this issue, whereas for something like HIV, which was much sort of slower and, and, and drawn out, you don't see these waves happening in quick succession, so you don't really notice the, the, the issue isn't as apparent. Um, and for other epidemics where you just see a single wave, again, these, these, these issues sort of are less, are less relevant. Um, and one of the main reasons why I worked with the MRC team on this, uh, the BSU team, was because they were been really interested in trying to monitor the severity of different variants for COVID. Um, but one of the findings of this piece of work is that the growth rate of the epidemic changes the severity. So if you've got two variants that are growing at different growth rates, any, any estimate of their relative severity is, is going to be biased by their relative growth rates. Um, and so that's why it's, it's, it's receiving quite a lot of attention so we can try and correct for this bias and then hopefully better understand what's happening. Okay, so yeah, during an epidemic, we want to understand what the risk of severe outcomes post-infection look like, um, but infections themselves are rarely observed directly. Instead, we have to approximate infection severity, um, usually based on case severity. So looking at the severity of the observed infections or, or, or the cases. Um, and so for case severity to be a reliable proxy of the infection severity, it needs to be an unbiased estimator of infection severity. However, um, through in this talk, I'll show that case severity actually fluctuates with the epidemic phase. So it fluctuates with the growth rate of the epidemic or whether it is growing or whether it's declining. Um, and this um, fluctuation is not reflected in the infection severity, which should be constant or you know it can change with variants or change with treatments, but doesn't change based on whether the epidemic is growing or declining. And therefore, case severity isn't a particularly reliable proxy. Um, and in this uh, talk, I'll just use a simple SIS toy model to demonstrate this bias. So to estimate severity, there's, there's various ways we can do this. So if, if you have linked data um, at line list level, um, providing you know, records of when individuals test positive, when they go to hospital, when they die. It's pretty straightforward to calculate severity because you can just look at the number of individuals testing positive on a certain day and then follow them to see what outcomes they have and, and divide one by the other to, to get a, a, a severity on, an, on any given day. Um, without linked data, we can use probabilistic methods instead. So if we just have aggregated data that tells us, say, H, the number of hospitalizations on a given day, C, the number of cases on a given day, and G, um, a delay distribution mapping these two time series onto each other, um, we can calculate a instantaneous case severity ST using this formula here. Um, we don't need to go much into detail that that's, a, that's another project I've been working on, but there, you know, a, a formula exists and you can calculate these things whether you have aggregated or individual level data. So the epidemic model we'll consider, um, I said I SIS at the start, but I lied, I, I meant SIR. Um, so we'll simulate an SIR epidemic using a Selker algorithm. And so from this, we can get a series of infection times for every individual in the population that gets infected. So this we denoted JI. And then we can simulate testing times, outcome times, and whether people go to hospital for each of these individuals. So firstly, testing times will be given by a random variable T, which is J plus a testing delay. And then if someone goes to hospital, which will have a Bernoulli um, random variable H, which denotes each person will either go to hospital or not. And if they go to hospital, they'll get an out outcome time A, which is again, J plus a, plus a different delay distribution. And what we're going to assume is that the testing delay depends on the severity of a person's infection. So this is basically assuming if someone you know, is going to go on to hospital, we might expect that they would seek tests earlier in their infectious period. 
Um, so, you know, they're basically saying if you've got more severe symptoms, you're probably going to have different test seeking behavior to someone who has mild symptoms. So what we do is we break this T down into two subsets. So we have the testing delay for people that go to hospital, which will be plus this random delay X2, and the testing for people that don't go to hospital, which is, is given by J plus random delay X1. Um, and so what we're going to see is how changing these distributions will, will change the relative severity. Um, so here's what the model output can look like. So we can have a, a time series of infections. Here we've just got a sing, simple um, single peaked epidemic goes up, comes down. Um, from that infections, we can simulate cases by simulating the testing time. So here I've assumed that everyone becomes a test, but there's a delay between infection and testing, and it gives us this black curve. Here I've run 50 independent simulations just to you know, capture some of that uncertainty in these testing delays. And similarly, we can simulate patient outcomes. So here I've assumed 10% of individuals go to hospital and they have um, a similar, uh, a slightly longer delay than cases. And that gives us this red curve here. So what we're interested in is how does the severity estimated by looking at this black curve relative to the red curve compare to the blue curve relative to the red curve. And that's what we're gonna call the epidemic phase bias. And here's just an example of how that looks. So here I've in the black curve is the estimated case severity um, at different times during the epidemic. And so we can see that whilst the epidemic is growing, the case severity is, um, so as I said, the baseline was 0.1, it was 10% experienced bad outcome. At the start of the epidemic, the, the case severity is significantly higher than the true epidemic severity at 0.1. Then as the epidemic starts to slow down and turn around, the black curve approaches 0.1. Then when the epidemic is declining, it drops below 0.1 and significantly underestimates the true severity. Um, this blue curve, we don't need to worry about now. I'll, I'll tell you what that, is, that, what that means later. The main thing, just focus on this black curve, starts above overestimating and then underestimates. So there's a clear bias in the case severity, which is related to, where the, related to the phase of the epidemic. So what we're first, what we're now going to do is we're going to we're going to prove that because because we're mathematicians and as I said this is a nice theoretical project um, that, that I've been working on. So to work out case severity, we want to use this formula here. So case severity will, throughout will be denoted by um, S tilde. So S tilde is the probability that a patient goes to hospital given that they test positive at time t, um, and that's you know given by this formula here, um, and we can separate this. So the probability that someone tests positive on time t is equal to the integral of all of their possible previous in, um, infection times, which is, is given by FJJ. Um, so that's just the density of, of being probability of being infected at, at previous time points. And then we have two possible testing delays. So we have the probability that they're severe and then the testing delay given their, that they were a severe case. We have the probability that they weren't severe and then the testing delay given that they weren't a severe case. Um, so here the S without the tilde represents the true underlying infection severity, um, whereas S tilde is, is the case severity. Similarly, we can, we can extract this, this, this other term from the, from the fraction. Uh, it's basically just given by the first part here, because here we've, we've got the intersection between they are a severe case and they test positive at time t. So it's just you know, the integral over all previous infection dates probability that they are severe and then the test and delay conditional on the fact that they were a severe case. So if we assume that the um, true infection severity S is, is constant over time, which is what we did in that numerical example, we just assumed it was 0.1 throughout the whole epidemic, then we can get rid of the time indexing on, on S and just replace it um, on ST and take it outside of the integral. Um, and what we're also going to assume here is exponential growth or exponential decay for the epidemic. So that's the probability density function of the shape of the force of infection is just replaced by this exponential term. Um, and so we can then simplify the equation to this expression here, um, which we can further simplify to this expression here. So this basically is, it gives us a clear relationship between S tilde and S. So if, if this um, fraction here is equal to one, then S tilde is equal to S. Um, for all time and there's, there's nothing to worry about um, and that would be the case if x1 and x2 were the same so if people had the same testing distribution regardless of whether they go to hospital or not then then there is no bias but as i said at the start if, if you're going to go to hospital you're going to have more severe symptoms you're going to notice them sooner you're going to go and book a test sooner and you're going to have a, a shorter on average testing delay distribution so to study that we're going to define these two um, functions a and b so A is the integral of the testing delays for the um, non-hospitalized and B is for the hospitalized. And we're gonna look at these in a bit more detail. 
So if we if we take that, then yeah, this is what our expression becomes. Um, and if we assume that the epidemic's been running for sufficiently long, um, so you know, in the case of COVID, if you're running for more than a couple of weeks, the testing delays become negligible. So you can replace these integrals um, with expected values. So that's what we've done here. And, and what we've got now is both of these uh, a function of, of e to the RT times by an expected value um, of a function of our testing delay distributions. And so if we assume that X2 is less than X1 in usual stochastic order, um, so that means that the probability that X2 is large is smaller than the probability that X1 is large. Um, so that's just one way of sort of formalizing the relationship that X2 on average we would expect to be smaller um, people to test sooner, pay people to test positive sooner after infection than, than in, under X1. Um, then using rules about usual stochastic ordering, uh, we can show that BT is greater than AT, provided R is greater than zero. So basically when an epidemic is growing, BT is greater than AT. And if we sub that back into this formula here, it then shows that, that then gives us that S tilde is greater than S when the epidemic is growing. Conversely, if R is less than zero and the epidemic is declining, then this reverses and, and the case severity S tilde is less than S. Um, so that this basically shows that the relative size of S tilde compared to S depends on, on the growth rate of the epidemic. And so there's a big bias as to what the epidemic is doing when we're looking at case severity. Um, so that's nice. We can we can prove that a bias exists. We can point that out to people, but that doesn't really help us, you know, try and model what's going on in the real world. Um, so this is where the the MRC BSU team have been have been really useful because they're they're experts in in causal inference. They've been trying to look at ways of correcting um, for this bias, and what they've suggested is instead of using X two for the testing delay distribution um, of hospitalized individuals, we define a new random variable X3, which is equal to X2 plus D, where D is the mean difference between the two. So D is the expected value of X2 minus the expected value of X1. Um, and so in practice, what this means is for every person in our data that it says has been to hospital, we ignore the testing date that the data gives us and we add a D to their testing date and we pretend that that's actually their testing date. Um, and in practice, we've, we found that really works quite well. And, and so here I wanted to explore that um, approximation using a Taylor approximation just to see when we would expect this correction to work and when we might expect it to fall apart. So if we apply a Taylor approximation to the ratio of A and B, um, so a second order Taylor approximation, we get this expression here um, when we were using X2. And if we use this new distribution X3, then the expected value of X3 is the same as the expected value of X1. So this becomes mu X1 here, um, and this becomes mu X1 here, but the variance remains the same as the variance of X2. So the variance term remains unchanged. And also we can look at this here. So we can see if, if the variance of our two distributions was, were the same, then using the shift correction would perform really well. A over B would be approximately one and we'd be fine. Alternatively, if the relative growth rate of the, if, if the growth rate of the epidemic is quite low, so it's the R squared, the magnitude of this R squared term is negligible, then we can discount this. And again, this will be approximately one um, and the, the shift correction will work quite well. Um, and so I've described how to do the shift correction to line list data, where you're going to just add this fixed constant to everyone, everyone's um, testing time. If we don't have line list data, we can apply the shift correction, but we have to use this, this more complicated formula here, um, which I won't go into too much detail with. but I'll, I'll show how the types of results are given. The true infection severity was this blue curve. So this was just showing that if you normalize by infection date um, rather than by testing date, you do in fact retain what you'd expect, the actual true infection severity. There is of course, lots of noise around this because we're using stochastic simulations. If Sorry, we apply- Chris, just, uh, oh. I think, did you, I don't know if anyone, I don't know if I dropped out or you dropped out for a second. <laughs> I flagged up for a second ago that I was, I was struggling. Where, where, where was I? Okay, I think we more or less got to the end of the last slide and then I didn't hear what the start of this. Yeah, so we saw okay. the rest, yeah. Yeah, so basically, so this is now investigating the performance of the shift correction um, using the stochastic simulations. 
So on the left, we have the figure that I showed earlier. So the black curve here was the, is the case severity. So this is your severity um, where you adjust for inf um, time of testing positive. The blue curve is the true infection severity. So that's the severity adjusting for the time they actually got infected. Um, and this is just to show that yeah, the, the infection severity isn't biased by the phase of the epidemic. That just stays constant, but it's a noisy curve just because we're using stochastic simulations. And the case severity has this huge bias, um, whereas overestimated and underestimated depending on the phase of the epidemic. If we apply the shift correction here, so we add that constant to everybody's testing time if they go to hospital, we get this purple curve here on the right. Um, and we can see basically it's, it's pretty much 100% eliminated the epidemic phase bias. We now see really good agreement between the purple and the blue. The only thing to notice here is that the purple curve is shifted forwards in time from the blue curve. And that makes sense because we've added this constant to everyone's testing time. So whereas the blue curve is normalized by infection date, this purple curve is normalized by effectively infection date plus 14 days, because that, that's the mean delay that we've gone for in, in the setup of this simulation. And, and that's basically why we've got this curve that's slightly shifted forwards in time. So this is for a relatively low exponential growth rate. Um, and so if you recall, when I said that growth rate is low, we would expect this shift correction to work really well because we're basically just looking at this term here and that's equal to one and, and the bias cancels out. If we have a higher growth rate, um, the first thing to notice is the magnitude of the epidemic phase bias has increased. So if we look at this left-hand plot, the magnitude of the overestimation and the underestimation of the true severity has increased substantially from this previous plot. So here we were looking at 0.1 to 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.12, and now we're at 0.1 and up to you know, 0.23 um, as the overestimation. So just, just by increasing the growth rate and not changing any of the underlying parameters, the magnitude of this bias has, has increased substantially. And if we apply the correction, we can see that it goes some way into reducing the bias. So I'd say that this purple curve on the on the right hand side is a much better representation of the true severity than this black curve on the left hand side. But we can see that it doesn't perform as anywhere near as well um, as the scenario when the growth rate was lower. Um, I mean, this is the type of growth rate that, that you know we, we, we've been seeing um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic since the first lockdown. This is looking at the type of growth rate we saw prior to that first lockdown. Um, so there's sort of you know a, an order of magnitude difference between these between these two growth rates. So that's um, the bias. And then if we have aggregated data, we can do the same thing. So this is just the low growth rate scenario. Um, and applying the shift correction to an aggregated data rather than to the line list data. Um, so again, the purple curve, we can see it, it looks like it's correcting the bias, but it doesn't work quite as well as the line list level data. And this is, is really just because we're making sort of two levels of approximation. First, we have to approximate the case severity um, from our aggregated data, and then we have to approximate the shift correction from that aggregated data. So there's just more approximations going in. So you, you'd expect the performance to be worse just because we, we're using aggregated rather than individual level data. Um, and so that's that. And then here's just a, a toy example of how this could look for COVID-19. So what I've done is I took the um, cases time series for the COVID-19 pandemic and pretended that that was the actual infections time series. So this infection time series in blue is actually the cases time series from, from England across the pandemic. Um, and then you have simulated outcomes um, and simulated cases from that data. And then plotted how the case severity would compare to a fixed infection severity. Um, and so we can see now we've got multiple peaks, multiple troughs, and the growth rate's changing a lot. We can see we don't just have a single bit of overestimation and underestimation. We have phases where first the epidemic was growing, we were massively overestimating severity, then we start underestimating, and it basically fluctuates with that growth rate of the epidemic. Um, and the key thing to think about here is we're, we're trying to compare different variants. And in particular, it was, I guess, very evident with the alpha and delta replacement in May, where the alpha variant was coming down and the growth rate growth rate was close to what, what we're seeing at this point here. Um, so quite a sharp, quite a, well, quite a, 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 a fast decline. And we see quite a big underestimation of the true severity in the alpha cases that we're detecting at that time. And then Delta emerged and the Delta growth rate was, was pretty close to the growth rate that, that gave, gave rise to this point here. And so Delta on the other hand, we're substantially 
overestimating the, the severity of delta. And then when you're trying to compare these two things, so we've got delta, which we're overestimating, we've got alpha, which we're underestimating. We're trying to work out a relative severity of these two variants by dividing one by the other. And this just causes the relative severity to be massively overestimated um, because of this epidemic phase bias. And, and so currently we're looking into ways of correcting it for the, the delta versus alpha um, scenario to see what the actual true severity advantage of delta um, is relative to alpha. Um, and now we've got delta, delta plus to worry about as well. And we, so we've still not quite managed to iron out the tools for getting these, these methods to work in with real data. Um, I mean, in theory, these methods are relatively simple. But to get it working with real data, um, the key thing I'm going to go, that was the last slide, so I'm just going to go right back to the start. Um, the key thing we need to think, we need to parameterize are these two distributions, x1 and x2. But to know them, we need to know, we need to accurately know the time from infection to testing broken down by the outcome of interest, which in this case is hospitalization, but it could also be death. And that's not particularly easy data to come about. Um, so we've got, so now I've joined UK HSA, I've finally got access to data that will let me do that through the through the contact tracing data. Um, but that's now been, that's been offline for a couple of weeks and it's come back on. So I'm hoping now, I've only been there for three weeks. So now I'm now finally to get access to that data again. I can hopefully get a good handle on what these distributions X1 and X2 look like. So we can actually get some proper estimates of, of relative severity of, of Delta, Delta plus alpha um, and any other variants we, we might be interested in. Um, and yes, that is, oh, here's just a, a, an example of, of what I meant by, it was quite obvious that um, severity has been changing over time. So this is a figure of um, care home case fatality rates um, across the pandemic. And we could see that, you know, it was, it was really high at the start, then lockdown happened, the severity came down low over summer, then cases started coming up again. Uh, and, and it rose to a plateau and they stabilized for a bit as we went into sort of tier threes, tier fours, jumped up again as the alpha variant came out and we hit that Christmas spike. Then we came into the lockdown in the new year and, and it plummeted again. And then recently we started seeing some small outbreaks happening in care homes. And, and you can see that, that you sort of see little bumps in the severity again as these outbreaks take off and then and then peter out. Um, so there's yeah, this clear linkage between, between severity and, and what the shape of the epidemic looks like. And that's the end. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Well, well done for being so uh, efficient. I guess that gives us a little bit of time maybe to ask some questions. And I guess people probably maybe have quite a few questions about, <laughs> uh, you know, this kind of work, especially if they're not working in, in, uh, in the COVID area. But, uh, well, I let people maybe either type or put their hands up or, or whatever. I, I've got a couple of questions, I guess. So you're inferring case severity, which obviously relies on the positive test. And I guess this is what's going so early in this uh, care home graph you're showing when it goes incredibly high. That's presumably because you only test people who are already very ill. And I guess that's the other ingredient you need to correct for is how likely people are to test anyway. Yeah, so that's the other issue. That's the, I've ignored that in, in this talk. I've ignored the fact that okay, for case for case severity to, to be useful, you have to then adjust for case ascertainment rates. Um, so yeah, in all the figures I've showed before, I, show, I assumed that case ascertainment was 100% and it was just a delay involved. Um, but I, I ignored that because that, that's a, of a well-explored issue. There's a lot of work. People, people know to adjust for case ascertainment when they're trying to infer infection um, severity. But this is more of a new a new bias that that's come to our attention um, over the last year, I guess. But yeah, so as you can see here, yeah, as you said in Carl, Carl that yeah, at the start, you know, basically care home residents were only getting tested when they went to hospital, and once they went to hospital, they had really high mortality rates. So yeah, we're seeing what sixty percent severity. Ignore a bit of the start. That's just the model burning in. Um, because you know you, you say these these you, your deaths and your cases start on the same day, so you end up with an infinite fatality rate because people don't die on the same day they day they get infected. But if you record your time series from the same day, then you get issues like that. But by the time that burns in, yeah, there's sixty percent very high case levels. Then a combination of of mass testing over summer, so we can see it a bit here. Mass testing in care homes started as we came into July, which is why there was just this sudden plummet in the CFR because the, the testing policy completely changed. And then after about September, um, the testing policy has been quite consistent. Um, and then it means a huge drop off here is going to be partially lockdown and partially vaccination effect. Um, so that's, that's why I first came 
this bias first came to my attention because I was trying to work out vaccination effect from looking at CFRs and realized there was just it was confounded with this epidemic phase effect and you know I could I could you know put an upper bound on one by assuming the other one had zero impact but knew that was unlikely to be a, a, a real a reasonable upper bound yeah yeah it's there's so, it's so many factors going into each step of that curve that, so each one needs a little uh sort of uh caption on it or something uh great the uh the other thing i was thinking where you mentioned variants and i wonder if uh you know every time a new variant emerges uh and is competitive and is growing and we tend to get headlines of this one is much more deadly than the previous ones usually i mean that's partly just the media but is that partly driven by this effect as well i mean like you say essentially delta if you naively estimate the case fatality ratio or the infection fatality ratio then it's much higher because just because it's growing and yeah so that's yeah, a, yeah, so that was so with delta it was i think yeah the headline figures were say yeah 2.5 times as severe or something in terms of hospitalization rates and yeah i mean as the data then comes comes on you know, those those estimates generally get revised downwards and from different countries all get different estimates and i think it's it's all to do with this so i think norway found no significant difference and i'm not seeing what their growth rates are like but they might have had less discre less difference between those growth rates which ours was a, the, the difference between the alpha and delta, delta growth rates in may was huge that it, it, it yeah that could have had a huge effect on these estimates um and so that's what we've been trying to adjust for um but that's why I need this this contact tracing data to work, and then hopefully we can work out what the, the true severity is. And I think that's why, again, with alpha versus the wild type, all the initial it was initially estimated to be way more severe, but then by February those severity estimates were revised back downwards. And I think that's because we saw you know a huge upwards and then downwards swing of alpha. So you probably had both, but the bias going in both ways. And at some point they're like, well, you know, all these effects have cancelled out, but it's. It's not an easy it's not an easy problem to solve basically um, because these things just aren't constant over time if you look at cases yeah yeah that's that's yeah that's interesting and and then, and then when you think you've got to handle it the vaccines come in and change the picture entirely for the better but yeah then it's uh, really hard to extract what they're actually doing <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and that doesn't it doesn't help that there's there's no good there's no good denominators for vaccinated populations either. So then when you try to compare, say, unvaccinated, yeah, the unvaccinated now is such a weird cohort. Like for, if you look over over 80s unvaxxed and you try to compare them to the risks of, say, un, over 80s vaxxed, it's so hard to match these cohorts because, you know, they're, they're very different populations that the people that, that sort of go that long. You have the people who clinically can't get vaxxed and then you have the people who choose not to get vaxxed and they're, they're both very different sort of demographics and populations to just the the, the vaxxed population. Mm. 